infrastructure at LinkedIn, infrastructure as code at LinkedIn. Um, our, our journey from imperative to declarative workflows. Now, before I'm hoping most of you have heard about LinkedIn uh, and use it often enough. If not, please log on there. Uh, daily active users always help. Uh, but just to go through the motions, uh, a little bit about LinkedIn. Uh, we are the world's largest uh, professional network with about 850 million members in more than 200 countries worldwide. Uh, our vision is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And the mission we've set out with is connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. A little bit about me. Uh, I, I have been at LinkedIn for about three and a half years now. Uh, I'm a senior staff uh, engineer, uh, founding member, tech lead for Terraform as a service team. Uh, current focus on IAC, policy and workflow platforms. So, so in this talk, I'm going to cover uh, certain agenda items like need for IAC, Terraform as a service, adoption strategy and progress. Uh, the main chunk of the talk is focused around adoption strategy and how we try to move from imperative to declarative workflows uh, and what we had to do to get it going at LinkedIn and so forth. So about need for IAC. Now I'm not going to talk about uh, benefits of IAC and Terraform in general because I'm assuming most of the folks in the room are already well versed with that. Uh, but we're going to take a top-down approach uh, on this as to why we needed IAC at LinkedIn. Uh, so first off, uh, LinkedIn is growing. As I stated earlier, we have about 850 million members with 26% increase in revenue year on year. Now, increase in revenue generally means more infrastructure, more services, more features being added in the back end. And in order to sustain this growth of us, we are constantly busy getting the site up and running and scaling up. So towards that, as I mentioned about the top-down approach, uh, we have something called as uh, Fabrics, which is nothing but a site or a stack or a data center, if you will. And these Fabric builds kind of take time. They, I think we originally, we built one every few years. And so when it took time, it was okay. Like, okay, are we doing this every four years? If it takes six months to nine months, that's fine. Let's pay the cost. But as we have grown uh, rapidly, we have to come to a place where we want to develop our uh, fabrics in multiples in a year. So towards that, we wanted to be more agile and nimble. Uh, just to give you an idea on the complexity of the fabrics, uh, our control plane just for the fabric requires working with 59 systems across 15 different orgs. So, it, it, so it's always challenging to uh, coordinate with different teams, get them working, map out the dependency, figure out how it's, uh, how it's brought up and so forth. Uh, complete bring up uh, requires working with 1500 plus services, uh, including data, infra, stateful systems, offline and online applications. So it's a fairly involved task from going from zero all the way to a live fabric that is serving LinkedIn.com. Uh, one thing we encountered over the course of various fabric builds was tribal knowledge is everywhere. Uh, and there was no uniformity in terms of op automation, bootstrapping or provisioning itself. Uh, some had bash scripts, some had Python scripts, some had a wiki doc which someone would run at the time of provisioning. And some, uh, some teams actually had that one person who's been here for a long time who knows how to do it and he'll do it again, sort of a, uh, approach. So we needed something better uh, that would standardize across LinkedIn. And uh, just to give you an example, our previous fabric builds times were around six to nine months each. So it was a fairly engineering intensive toil uh, that we had to take on every time a new fabric had to be built. So to solve this problem, we built uh, TFAS and adopted Terraform. Uh, we set out with the following goals uh, around TFAS. That is, provide a standardized platform for IAC developers. Um, so 
in a nutshell, we were a Terraform remote execution as a service. Uh, we provided all the bells and whistles and made, made sure whatever was needed to help productionalize IAC, we would do it inside of TFAS and the user would focus just on writing IAC. So no, no worrying about encryption at risk, high availability, back, backups, uh, state file management, uh, upgrades, uh, if they're going from a version Terraform version X to Y and there's a breaking change, which we have seen a couple of times, we manage that process for them. Um, we wanted to allow the user purely to focus on authoring IACs and nothing else. Um, we also wanted to unify our workflows across different uh, organizations, uh, enabling CI CD for IAC. So, no more custom Terraform implementation by org X versus org Y and so forth. So, uh, so given those set of uh, one of the goals and uh, provide providing a standardized platform. The next step we also wanted to do was support both on-prem and cloud uh, deployments uh, because that's where we are. Uh, then, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, uh, we're going to take a top-down approach, uh, building fabrics, that's one of the main use case. So one of the biggest requirement we had was uh, ability to bootstrap a fabric. Now, what that meant was, uh, TFAS would be one of the first services to come up in a region and be operational without any dependencies on uh, LinkedIn primitives. So it should be operational without LinkedIn auth being there, Git being there, other services being there. And it would bring up the LinkedIn services one by one and then switch over to start using LinkedIn primitives when it's completely operational. So towards this, we had to uh, implement something called as manage mode and unmanage mode. Unmanaged mode was pretty much pure vanilla Terraform with bring your own auth story, where uh, you had to uh, work with uh, Azure primitives and so forth, get it up and running. It was a very secure environment. Only few people were allowed to use unmanaged mode. But once the seed was there in a fabric, we could uh, switch over to managed mode and folks can use Terraform using LinkedIn auth and other providers and so forth. The one of the big goals we also set out to do uh, for the uh, platform as well is make adoption of declarative workflows viable. Uh, so the, one of the challenges we faced and we knew from the get go was there's a lot of inertia uh, associated with using CLI and UI uh, in getting things uh, rolling or the way users interact with different provisioning services. So uh, we set out uh, from the day zero, like we will add features which will make this journey from CLI UI to IAC more easier for our folks. Mm -hmm. So real quickly, uh, I'll go over briefly the TFAS architecture. It's pretty straightforward, nothing much complicated. Uh, what you see here are just the core components. Uh, we have other services and dependencies that we have to uh, which help uh, run our particular workflows. But at its core, uh, we have an ALB router which requests routes request to the respective uh, TFAS API server. TFAS API server will go get the relevant metadata, where's the state file stored, what's the Git repository, uh, perform authorization, auth checks, any policies that are there at the global level, and then uh, create a job and enqueue it into a service bus. Uh, on the other side of the queue, we have uh, TFAS workers, which are listening for this queue. They pick up a job, they go and run it, update the state file where needed, update the database where needed. So this allows us to scale horizontally and vertically, um, and uh, we could handle an, any amount of load that was being thrown at us by just adding more uh, servers, both on the API side and the worker side. So with this, this was our MB, MVP and uh, beta that was released to our already adopter customers. And from there, we wanted to grow our usage, going from those who were excited about Terraform to getting those on board like, yeah, okay, this is new, I, do I, I really have to do it kind of. So part of our adoption strategy was make it uh, easy to move IAC. Uh, so we have this fancy system and we are trying to sell it. Uh, 
we don't want pain points to come up for our users in when they're starting this journey on this. So one of the first things we added was called one click import and it auto create IAC a review pull request by pointing TFAS to existing resources. So we were well aware that TFAS came in the middle where there were tons of resources already provisioned and managed and so forth. Uh, so it would be kind of hard to ask folks to, hey, just delete those resources and start fresh or something like that, right? And having them to do the import and manually craft the ISC was also not a pleasant experience uh, that uh, we, we generally and generally wanted to avoid folks to have that toil on them. So we created a provider agnostic solution. So as long as a provider has the imp uh, import uh, implementation there, uh, we were, you could point to a resource and provided that provider was part of our ecosystem. Uh, it would facilitate importing of existing uh, resources to TFAS and we would automatically create the IAC for the user uh, and fill up all the fields, create a GitHub pull request and uh, the user can just accept the PR or RB and it will automatically merge and the resource will be managed by TFAS going forward. So uh, this is a this is the uh, example command that you would have to run. Uh, ULPS TFAS import apply. We have some metadata information in the CLI, but the most important part is the uh, Kafka topic ID, resource type, and the ID that you want to point it to. And in the results section, you can see that we have a link to the RB that is created, as well as what will be imported in there. So apologies if this is too small, uh, but uh, and a little bit blurry. Uh, but here is the diff that's created automatically by our tool, which would have the resource block and all the fields filled out. Um, and so you can see that if you have a fairly complicated uh, resource block, it's easier for users to just do this rather than try to fill out the IAC themselves. And uh, this, that's actually one of the workflows we kind of saw emerge as well with this tool, where people would use their existing tooling of choice, UI, CLI, click, 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 and then point TFAS to that resource, get the IAC created automatically rather than them having to craft it manually. So it was an interesting approach that we saw, uh, sort of a side effect of it, but it works out well. Uh, our, in the end, our goal is to make sure folks start using ISE to capture their intent. So if they do it this way, that's fine because going forward, they, all the updates will still happen through IAC. So, so we talked about import workflows. Uh, the next one is sandbox workspaces. And one might ask, why do we need this, right? So, some of our providers, the in-house ones, uh, were auto-generated based on the REST schema that we have internally. And a lot of them provided only server-side validation. So you could create, select a name and then only after an apply would the server-side come back and say, hey, do not put uppercase letters or dashes in them and so forth. Uh, so, of course, folks could put this in the provider validation check itself, but because it was auto-generated, this was starting to be really uh, cumbersome for our developers. Uh, and the review and merge requirements for TF apply lowered developer productivity considerably, especially when they were experimenting with uh, new things. And uh, this was the first time they're trying to bring out a resource and they want to play around with it to figure out what's happening. So in some cases, the metrics we saw were more than 30 commits to get it right. So that was never a pleasant experience and it left a bad taste in the mouth. So towards this, uh, our solution was to create something called a sandbox workspaces. Uh, each workspace would get assigned to a user, uh, specifically the sandbox workspace. And this would allow applies to happen without actually committing to master and but only in test environment. So we had dedicated environments where folks could write IAC, commit to the local uh, branch, and then uh, run apply on it, see what comes up and so forth. Uh, of course, we did not want to make this the de facto standard of creating IAC. 
where folks are able, oh, I can get a sandbox workspace up and running and I don't need code reviews. Here's my infrastructure is up, my service is running, people will not bother us anymore. So towards that, we added some special features in this uh, sandbox workspace. Uh, one of them is uh, our workspace would expire X number of days and it will automatically clean up, destroy itself. Uh, and after a certain number of time, before cleanup, you would stop taking any requests on action. So you couldn't do plan, you couldn't do apply, you can't read output, but the only thing you could do was uh, uh, destroy it by yourself if you wanted to. So, so the other areas we focused on was developer experience as well. We added many features to support this. And most of these you would find in uh, other implementations of Terraform Cloud, Atlantis, and so forth as well. Uh, some of them were integration with review systems. Uh, so whenever a PR or whenever an IAC change is made, the testing done section gets automatically updated. Uh, we also added failure classification and next step messages. So. We were a small team when we were growing this and having an operational load of many engineers trying to use Terraform for the first time. We wanted to keep that low. So towards that, the, one of the first things we added to was ability to parse messages and uh, assign next steps for it. So for hypothetically, your resource failed, uh, the provider owner could uh, add a parser and say, hey, if this failed, go to this stack overflow question and look what happened there or something like that. So this was uh, done not at the provider level, but at the UX level in DFAS itself, so that it could be highly customizable to the current scenario. Uh, we also added resource destruction protection. Now um, this is inbuilt and we added this after an outage uh, that we suffered where folks, uh, as they're coming new onto Terraform, sometimes it's easy to uh, misread the plan. Uh, a create before a, a destruction, a destroy in place and then create or uh, just a whole destroy happened and they don't realize why it happened or something like that. So towards that, we added sort of like a two factor to any destroy actions that would happen. So you have to, if there's a plan detects uh, destruction is happening of any resource, we would stop you in the track and say, warn you with big red sign like, hey, the resources are being destroyed. Are you okay with this? If you are okay with this, give us a one time. This is the one time code that you need to provide us for us to go ahead and execute this job further. So uh, this, some Terraform friendly teams found this really annoying, uh, but others found it very, really useful. So by globally, this was enabled, but we allowed certain teams to disable this feature if they were totally confident in what they were doing. Now, the other thing I've already mentioned in the platform, we also took care of automatic version upgrades, even if there were breaking changes, even if there were code changes required on IAC side as well. Uh, so going from zero point, I think we started with 12.20 all the way to 1.2. Uh, we had certain gravity in certain uh, usage, different usage uh, of versions and to consolidate all on one, it, the only way we would make it happen to be less painful for the user was that we did the migration for them automatically. So whether it was updating the state file internally or whether it was uh, updating the IAC files to capture the change and so forth. So we took care of that as well. So going forward again in the adoption strategy, uh, helping folks who say, you can take my CLI from my cold dead hands. Uh, we've uh, run into this many times, uh, like why can I use CLI? Where can I use CLI? Why can't I keep using my CLI and so forth, right? Uh, and they had good reasons as well, right? Um, there could be a, great, a glass break scenario, break, sorry, break glass scenario where something's on fire, I don't have time for this IAC shit, I let me run this one command and it'll be fixed. Uh, or just a force of habit. Uh, we found that within a team itself, some embraced IAC culture were going through the review process and so forth, but others didn't uh, still wanted to use a CLI. So you would keep running into situations where there was a mixed bag and the outcome was never nice. So towards this, we added something called as drift detection. I'm pretty sure most of you might have heard about this uh, coming out of Ter Terraform natively as well in Terraform Cloud. We've had this for about a year and a half now. 
uh, where uh, we run uh, your IAC, we run a plan against your dist uh, deployed resources and compare if this actually drift happened and warn the user that uh, a drift has happened, please resolve the drift before moving ahead. Uh, in this example here, you can see there's a, the use for health value has changed from true to false, uh, sorry, the other way around, and uh, probably via CLI or something like that. So this would help alert the user something has changed and IAC is no longer the uh, up-to-date. To take it a step further, we had something called a drift mitigation. Now, there are two ways to resolve drift. That, uh, one is to enforce your current IAC, like, hey, drift happened, I know that was a mistake, my IAC is king, I'll use that. Or you can update the IAC to reflect the changes that were made outside of IAC. And this is specifically the CLI example that I use where someone in the team has used CLI even though there's IAC because they wanted to keep using CLI. So to bridge that gap, we built a drift remediation recommendation engine. Um, so whenever drift would be detected, we would try and create a review or a pull request by TFAS, which would capture the changes made uh, outside of TFAS into the IAC file. And so we would try to update the IAC file to see whatever was changed outside and run a plan to ensure drift would be resolved by the IAC changes that we have made. So here's a sample RB that uh, gets created and apologize for the small text again. But the main portion is uh, we have a drift rec remediation recommendation for XYZ. Uh, in the testing done section, we run our updated IAC and see, hey, there are no changes. So this is good to go to help you reconcile it. And this is a sample RB. So going by the same example that we saw, use for health. If you look at, I think, uh, line 20, uh, you can see that there is a use for health has been updated to reflect what was the value changed by CLI. Now, the interest, uh, interesting part here is that we actually don't do any, this is all done using Terraform state file and IAC files that we have internally. We do not snoop on CLIs, we do not you know, go and query uh, resources or uh, event history and something to see what changed and try to reconcile it. It's all natively in Terraform. As long as that resource is managed by TFAS, we can uh, help do this. So, one of the limitations of our engine right now is, of course, you see the big green block right now. And uh, that is because by default, we also put the default values in there if they were not captured in the IAC itself. So we're working on improving it, but that's where it is right now. So, on, so this is what our internal, how we solve the drift remediation problem. Um, so on a very high level, uh, this is internally what we are doing is we are building a DAG of uh, resources based on the state file representation. And at the same time, we do static analysis on the IAC files to link uh, resources represented in a state file to actual IAC file blocks. And uh, once we have those nodes uh, built, we know what the input and the output are. That is output vari variables coming into a particular resource and variables going outside. And then when a, once a drift uh, plan uh, detection is run, we know exactly which resource changed. And based on that, we would propagate up or down uh, the value that changed and see where it stopped. Uh, of course, this had some limitations. Uh, uh, so I think one of them is we, so far we have only solved this for flat IAC. And as we are observing modules are getting more and more popular in our usage. So it does not work for most modules. Uh, it's not a limitation. It's, it's just that we haven't focused on implementing it that yet. We know how to implement it for modules as well. And uh, similarly, I think the other limitation we have is that this does not work with local variables and interpolations. So if your, if your value changed, which then is joined with other variables together to form another value, which then gets assigned to a resource, uh, we don't go that deep. So we just work on one-to-one. -one. Uh, in our analysis though, uh, 
local, I mean, interpolation problems, we actually saw very little uh, usage of that in uh, where this would happen. So we actually haven't focused on that and we don't plan to in the near future for now. So where are we uh, in terms of progress? Uh, as uh, Since we talked about fabric bills, let's look at it. Um, we generated IC for migrations. Uh, we uh, did some centrally, some we asked the teams to write them themselves and uh, give them the format, the providers for them to write it. Uh, based on that, we created six functional fabrics within two years, uh, three production, three test, and 15 plus ephemeral fabrics as well for various levels of testing. Now, I would like to point out that fabric build is uh, not the only use case, but the one with the most uh, impact measurable. That is, uh, we could time it, okay, earlier it took six, nine months, now it's taking a month or so. Or so. Uh, we have more traditional use case adoption as well. Uh, some networking services backend are using TFAS to implement ACL rules, uh, network rules, and so forth. Some are managing their resources in Azure using Terraform directly or uh, resources in LinkedIn itself through T, uh, TFAS. Uh, just some high level metrics as of I think FY22 Q3. Uh, this is still with fabrics not being completely live. That is the bootstrap, but uh, not ramped with uh, user traffic. Uh, we had about 1950 workspaces, average workflows, we were executing about 8,000 per month. Uh, peak executions, I think we maxed out at about 36,000 in one case. Uh, after that, we said like, yeah, we can keep scaling out, but we don't want to just throttle your <laughs> request a little bit. Uh, then a number of users I think we've seen is more than 500. Uh, number of services, about 200, more than 200 or so and uh, around 7,000 resources were being managed through Terraform with TFAS, okay? So, of course, all of the things I mentioned, uh, one thing that comes to mind is why not Terraform Enterprise? And I like to get into uncomfortable situations, being at HashiCorp conference, I still want to explore why, uh, talk a little bit about why we did not go with that. Uh, First and foremost, the biggest challenge for us was integration with LinkedIn ecosystem. Uh, we are huge. We have our own lot of toolings investment happen on the back end already with tons of gravity around that. So uh, at the time of evaluation, our, in, our engineering auth system would not have worked with Terraform Enterprise from the get go. So that was a big problem. Then we had issues with CD system integration where our CD system would have to be re-architected to accommodate for this use case. Uh, LinkedIn internally also uses something called as Restly, which is an open source uh, standard around REST for schema management and so forth. Uh, to support this uh, in Terraform Enterprise, we would have effectively had to build a proxy in front of TFE, uh, which uh, seemed like overkill. <laughs> to be honest, and to get the core functionality working of TFE, it actually did not take us too long. Um, of course, I already went over the custom workflows that we absolutely needed to make ISC a success at LinkedIn, uh, creating a smoother transition from uh, declarative workflows was really important for us. So the import workflow, the uh, drift detection, drift remediation, and so forth. Uh, we, from the day zero, we thought, okay, these are the things we want to solve for going forward. Uh, and of course, uh, we have massive scale, so cost does play a factor in deciding a few things. Uh, 1,500 plus applications across 6,000 plus engineers uh, could be massive, and we didn't want to be in a situation where folks are structuring their op ops uh, or IAC code just to save on cost and so forth. So, uh, so that concludes our talk. I would like to thank the audience for taking the time. TFAS team members, both uh, here, here on the screen, you see some TFAS team members, both uh, past and present, who made this happen. Uh, I think we started with two or three engineers for uh, about three or four quarters before uh, more folks joined in and helped us take to GA and so forth. So, yeah.